If you grew up in church, no doubt you recognize these wonderful, well-known miracles. Now, they're usually taught separately with a myriad of applications, some quite interesting. I must admit, I, I feel a bit of a warmth here reading these three miracles. It's like reading one of your favorite novels again. It brings back wonderful memories, lots of excitement, but yet oftentimes as you dig deeper, there's a nagging question as to why the author included them here. Now we know, we've been doing this long enough, that we know the Gospels are not a a collection of stories by four authors that are doing their best to get their memories into ink before they die and these stories pass out for future generations. We know that narratives in the Gospels are arranged in a particular order, for a particular purpose, with particular facts, in order to uh, proclaim a particular truth. Thus, these miracles aren't here just to make us in awe of our Savior, though that's a nice added benefit. They're here for a reason. They're arranged in such a way that the Gospel author wants to give us a timeless truth about who Jesus is and what He has done and what our responsibility to follow Him looks like. Let me say that again. The Gospel narratives are to explain who Jesus is, what He has done or will do, and then what our response is to be as we follow Christ towards glory. And so why are these miracles here? Better yet, why should I preach all three of them in one Sunday? It'd be a lot easier just to take one at a time. Well, it's not an easy answer, and many commentators disagree or or, or seem to focus on certain aspects. But I think... I think the context gives us some clues as to why Matthew arranges them here and in this way. Look with me back at last week's text. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 1. Then some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? I think I had you circle that last week. Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now, of course, we know from last week, Jesus did not immediately answer them, but he said, I've got a question for you myself. Why do you neglect obedience to the law in favor of your own man-made traditions? What they were asking about was something that probably originally came from the book of Leviticus, where the priest on special occasions for special sacrifices would wash in the brass laver before the temple. But by the time Jesus came on the scene, washing, specifically this ritual washing that I showed you last week, was done before every meal to cleanse one of defilement. So it wasn't, it wasn't a, that they were germaphobes, okay, or that they were worried about bacteria. It was a ceremonial, ceremonial defilement that they were trying to get rid of. You say, well, how were they defiled? Well, there was a whole list of things in Scripture, but then also added to by the tradition of men of how they might get defiled. You know, you might be walking through the marketplace and bump into a Roman soldier. Well, that's a Gentile. He's clearly an uncircumcised heathen. Therefore, when I touch him, I am no longer holy. I am defiled, or so they thought. Maybe they unwittingly um, ate something that they didn't know uh, had been uh, made or, or harvested near pork. Who knows? But they might have been defiled. Therefore, they would wash their hands to cleanse themselves. Jesus says, no, that's not the correct understanding. In fact, look at verse 10. He answers it. He calls the crowd to him. So he's been speaking to the Pharisees and he says, hey, come in here. I want you to hear this. Hear and understand. It's not what enters into the mouth that defiles a man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles a man. And of course, we've heard Christ teach on this. It is out of the mouth that the heart speaks. It is not things that are good or bad that make you defiled, that make you less holy or corrupted. It is the heart that bears witness to whether it worships either the creation or the Creator. It is the heart that tells us out of the mouth as to whether you're truly a follower of Yahweh or a worshiper of self. But I want you to think about that in context as we approach these three miracles. One, that the Jews had this concept that things were good or bad, and if I touched them, they would defile me. 
But there's one other aspect I want you to focus on too. Do you remember when Christ responds to them, he said, why do you break the law of God, the commandments of God, for your own man-made tradition? And he says, and I'll be specific. Why do you dishonor your parents? Why do you break the fifth commandment and say, I don't have to provide for you because I've taken my assets and I've claimed, you remember the term? Corbin. Corbin. And it was this man-made tradition where they could say, yeah, all that I own over here, I love God so much, I'm going to give it to Him. I'm going to claim this for God. But then the loophole was this. I don't have to actually give it to God until I die. So mom and dad, I'd love to help you, but you know what a passionate follower of God I am. And I have dedicated all that I have to God. I've claimed it to be Corbin, so I really can't help you out. And Jesus says, baloney. Literally, that's what it is in the Greek. Baloney. He says, come on. He says, you know better. You, you, you're choosing to look holy. In fact, he draws upon Isaiah and he says, you're a hypocrite. You're pretending you're worshiping God all for the purpose of avoiding caring for your parents. In fact, he goes a step further. All for the purpose of avoiding obedience to God. Because remember how the commandments are summed. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbors yourself. You get that first one right, the other nine parts of the Decalogue come together. You get love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You will love your neighbors yourself. You will obey the commandments. So think about those two things as we approach this text. One, this, this man-made tradition that things defile me if I touch them. And two, I really don't want to show compassion to people. So that Judaism, that I really don't want to show compassion to people. I want to look good. I want people to think I'm worshiping. But I really don't want to actually love people as an, as an overflow of my love for God. Now with that in mind, look at chapter 15, verse 22. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out. Circle Canaanite woman. Now look at verse 26. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the, what? Dogs. Circle that one. What do we have here in these two verses? Before we even dig in, we have an unclean woman with an unclean problem. So much so that Jesus even uses the word dog. All right, keep it going. Look at verse 36. And he took seven loaves and the fish and giving thanks, he broke them and started giving them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. What we have here in the feeding of the 4,000 is not feeding of 5,000 Jews, Jewish men that we saw earlier. These are Gentiles. So we've got a meal with unclean Gentiles, a prayer of thanksgiving, but no what? No hand washing. So whatever this text is about, we have to kind of put up on the board and say, hold on, this is about Jesus going to the unclean, getting his hands dirty by all Jewish standards, and yet just the opposite of defilement is happening. He's not getting defiled. In fact, they're getting cleansed. And so, I mean, when it hit me this week, I thought, whatever's here, this is is got to be the driving force. In context, Jesus is saying things don't make so defiled, and in fact, compassion or lack thereof is an overflow of the heart. And then we go into these three miracles where he actually goes to the unclean and shows them compassion. Are you with me? All right, understanding that, let's look at the text together. But let's pray first. Father, we ask that You would bless our time, that You would give us illumination here. I pray that I truly would be able to cut it straight this morning, that I would not muddy the waters of Your Word, that we would understand it, we would rejoice in it, we'd be excited to learn about it, but it wouldn't stop there. Lord, I pray that it would spur within us a desire to follow Christ and to imitate Him. Lord, help us to remember 1 Corinthians 11 when Paul looks at the Corinthian church and says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Lord, in this picture here, we have Christ going to an unclean people. 
And He is loving them deeply. He is showing compassion. And He is not worried about His own defilement. But He is showing a God-like love to them. May we do the same right here where we're at. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, the title of our sermon today is Get Your Hands Dirty Like Jesus. Okay? Our timeless truth is as Jesus came to seek and save the outcast and the outsider, so we should pursue the same with the life-saving gospel. Three points will divide our time. Number one, unclean ancestry. That's going to be the Canaanite woman. Two, unclean condition. And three, unclean community. Unclean ancestry. Verse 21. Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. You're like, okay, where's that? Well, Tyre's 35 miles from Gennesaret, where he just was, okay, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And then it's another 25 miles to Sidon. Here's what you need to know about that. This is Gentile country. This is dog land, okay? This is the bad lands. If you're a Jew, you don't go to stay, you just pass through. Every Jew gets this. He realizes what's going on. Craig Bloomberg, uh, a uh, commentator, says, Jesus has obviously withdrawn from, Israel's, uh, from Israel ideologically, and now he withdraws geographically. They say, why is that important? Well, what is Matthew trying to teach us? The king has arrived, and with it, the establishment of his kingdom. So if you're a Jewish Messiah, a Jewish king, and you come to establish your kingdom you're going in the wrong direction. Amen? He's going to the Gentiles. And if you're pursuing ritual cleanliness as the son of David, if you're supposed to be the best of the best, this is not the place to go and stay clean. This is not the place to go and pursue holiness. He's going to get dirty. You know, if you had a reality show back then, this would be dirty jobs. It would be called dirty rabbis. Okay? Look at verse 22. It gets bad, and then it gets worse worse. He's in Gentile country, and a Canaanite woman came from that region and began to cry out, saying, have mercy on me. Lord, son of David, my daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Now, if you know your history, you know something's a little amiss there, okay? This is, let's say, 32 AD, 30, 32 AD, and Matthew mentions a woman and describes her as a Canaanite. Now, kiddos, you've been studying in the Old Testament Canaanites, but that's primarily the Pentateuch, Judges, Joshua, that area, historical books. But you don't see Canaanite in the New Testament, do you? In fact, if you go to Mark, Mark refers to to her as a Syrophoenician woman. Why then does Matthew call her a Canaanite? Before I answer that question, let's remind ourselves what a Canaanite is. Canaanites controlled the promised land. They worshipped the Baals. They were involved in child sacrifice. And this phrase you see over and over again throughout Joshua and Judges is, quote, and they did not drive the Canaanites out completely and as a result made them their slaves. And of course, there's a flip-flop, isn't there? Because what happens to the Israelites? They start to worship Canaanite gods, then they're enslaved by the Canaanites, and that's what you have with the seven cycles in the book of Judges. Here's what we know about them archaeologically and historically. They worship the Baals, the Asherahs, the uh, Ammonites. I think it was the Ammonites worship Molech, which was known for child sacrifice. I mean, they were uh, sexual ritual cults. They were debased. They were demonic. They were the worst of the worst. Jews considered them, rightly so, unclean, unkempt, and unwanted adversaries of Israel. Period. They were a thorn in their flesh because they didn't take care of them when they went into the promised land. God said, every place where the sole of your foot treads, I will give you the promised land. From where? Mediterranean Sea all the way to the river Euphrates, from the north all the way to the south, where we would consider the Sinai Peninsula. It was theirs. All they had to do was what? Walk it. That the Lord would fight their battles for them. That the Canaanites would die, but they got lazy, didn't they? After Joshua divided up the land, they said, eh, you know, I'm kind of tired of fighting. 
they're ready to start farming. And as a result, the Canaanites persisted. So did their sin. Matthew uses this designation here for a reason. Okay? We might say it this way. You know, you can uh, swab the, your saliva now and do your, your DNA, right? Ancestry.com or whatever it is. And of course, be careful what you, what, what you ask for, right? <laughs> I'm looking for the famous. I'm looking on, you know, my, my family is all English, right? You know, and then you find out, you know, no, we were Vikings that uh, drank the blood of our enemies. You know, things like that. That's what he's saying here. Syrophoenician sounds nice. She's a Canaanite woman. That means if we're talking ritual cleanliness, where is she on the scale? Way down here. Okay? He wants us to realize that this is something bad. Imagine then being the disciples. You hear a Canaanite woman complaining that her daughter is demon-possessed, and you have a tendency to think, well, now what did you expect? Right? You're a Canaanite. Y'all probably still got demonic trinkets hanging around the house. Come on. You can't play in the mud and expect your clothes to be white. So all of that comes to bear here, and yet Jesus is in Gentile territory, and a Canaanite woman is in need. And I want you to notice something else here. What is she crying out? What's the designation? Lord, which, which can mean master. It doesn't have to mean God, but, but she knows it's a special designation. Master, Lord, son of what? David. Now hold on, if she's a Canaanite, she just addressed him by his kingly name. His covenant kingly name. Because the son of David means David who had the reiteration of the Abrahamic covenant. He was the one who would be the Messiah. She is saying, you're the one. And not only that, she wants to pay allegiance to him. To the disciples, well, she's just, an annoying, she's just an annoying Canaanite. So much so that, look what they say. Verse 23, would you send her away? Tell her to move on, please. This is getting annoying, Jesus. It's bad enough we're here in Gentile country, but come on. Now, we don't know if that means tell her to go away or would you just grant her wish? Would you heal her daughter? But whatever it is, make her stop. In fact, it says she began to cry out. That's in the imperfect. It's an ongoing thing. She's following them. She's crying out. Lord, Son of David, could you please stop for a minute? You don't understand. My, my daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Lord, Son of David. And yet it says He doesn't answer her at all. So stop there. What are you thinking? Well, we're thinking, this is Jesus. He's going to do the right thing here in a minute. He's, he's going to turn around and he's going to say something endearing to her, right? That's kind of what we're hoping. It's not what he does. Verse 24, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she kept crying. Once she made eye contact with him, she comes up to him. She throws herself down. She says, Lord, help me. And then he just swings for the fences here to insult her. It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Whoa! I don't care what world you live in, that's rough. It's not good to take the children's bread. Who are the children? Jews. It's not good to take the promises of Israel and give it to the dogs. Now before we're too hard on Jesus, I want us to just analyze this and think about it for a minute. Dogs. I think we realize that's insulting, right? Some commentators try to downplay it and say, well, he's using the word for house pet rather than a wild dog, but let's be honest, if you're called a dog, it's kind of insulting. There's just no way around it. You know, Joy's family, her family name is Parzino. We still don't know how it's spelled because when they came through Ellis Island, they maybe dropped a Z or two. We're not sure. But her great-grandpa, I believe, came to America in the early 1900s. Came from Naples. And no doubt he was denied a job or two. And I imagine he experienced some ethnic slurs. You see, at that time, uh, Italian thugs were called guapo. 
See, in Spanish, guapo means handsome, but in Italian, that means thug, guapo. And it was eventually shortened and anglicized to guap, which came to mean without papers. It was an ethnic slur. And I imagine, I don't know, that that her great-granddaddy heard, well, I can't give you this job. You're, You're a guapo. You're a wop. You're without papers. You're not good enough. The reason I tell you that is that I want you to feel what Christ is saying to her. You're not part of the covenant. And it's an ethnic slur any way you look at it. Even today, if you go to the Middle East, dogs are regarded as unclean. I remember traveling in the Emirates and, and uh, having dinner with a family one time, an Arabic family, and we were just chit-chatting, and they said, well, you know, do you have a pet? And I said, well, yes, I, I, I have a, a dog, I have a greyhound. And they literally recoiled in disgust. The girls went, ew! I'm like, what? It's a nice dog. And they're like, no, 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 that's unclean. Now keep in mind they keep falcons as pets, which is not exactly cuddly, okay? But this is how the Jews saw things. You know, the Gentiles were lower. They were without papers. They were without covenant. But, in saying that, while this is true, I don't think Jesus is being mean-spirited here. Let me explain what I mean. First of all, He doesn't answer her. And she continues to pursue Him. And then He answers her with, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And she still keeps coming and bows before him. And so the third thing he does is to say it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And I think he's got a twinkle in his eye. Let me tell you why. I think he looks at her and I think he's saying it in such a way that he's testing her faith. Now speculation here, but hang with me. I think it could sound something like this. You want my help? You've acknowledged that I'm the son of David, the Messiah, and that I have come to bring blessing to the children of the Abrahamic covenant. You are outside the Abrahamic covenant. You're considered a dog. What do you think about that? And I think he's watching her. I think he's testing her. Watch what she says in verse 27. Yes, Lord, Even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Now, if that had melt your heart, I don't know what will. Think about about that statement. What is she saying? I know. I'm a Canaanite. I know I'm outside the covenant of Israel. I know I don't deserve anything, but guess what? The crumbs that fall from the Messiah's table are above and beyond anything I could ever imagine. I'll take it. Now you think about what salvation is. What is salvation? Salvation is not working your way. It's not demanding your rights. It's not saying, God, you owe me. It's saying, I know I deserve nothing. I know that I am unclean, that there is no righteousness within me. But I also know that even the crumbs that you give me will be above and beyond anything that I could ask or think. And in this moment, she not only recognizes him as God, as the Son of God, but she pledges her allegiance to him. And what does he do? O woman, verse 28, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Yeah, her daughter was healed, but let me tell you what happened there. He pulls the chair back and he says, daughter, come sit down. And the Messiah, the host, invites her to the table. No, not crumbs. No, he invites her to the table. And he treats her as a daughter of the king. He shares his bread. Not as if he's sharing it with an unclean beggar, but it is as if he's sharing it with his own daughter. And this has got to blow the minds of the disciples. You've got to realize it was bad enough that she was a Canaanite. She was a woman. No respectable Jew would have a conversation with a woman. That's why the, gen, that's why the uh, disciples got so wigged out when he was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. And then add to that, she's got a demonic daughter. Those, that's a triple threat of uncleanliness. Ew! Gentile dogs! Jesus says, uh-uh. Your faith is great. Come, sit down. Sit at my table. The di- disciples got it then. But I'll promise you they got it later. 
what is all of this foreshadowing? What is all of this giving us a picture of for the future? Let me give you a couple things here. One, Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. If you belong to Christ, you are part of the covenant. Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. He is bringing together and giving us a picture that the mystery of the Jew and the Gentile are co-heirs in the covenant. And look around. It's the bride of Christ. We were the Canaanite woman. We were the ones who were outside. We were the ones who were clean, outcast, impacted by demonic activity. And yet we're the ones who've been invited to the table. Secondly, look at our unclean condition here. Verse 29, departing from there, Jesus went along by the Sea of Galilee and having gone up into the mountain, He was sitting there. And the large crowds came to Him, bringing with them those who were lame, crippled, blind, mute, and many others. And they laid them down at His feet and He healed them. So the crowd marveled as they saw the mute speaking, the crippled restored, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they glorified the God of Israel. He leaves the region of Tyre and Sidon and he goes to the region, Mark tells us, of Decapolis. Deca, ten, polis, city. Ten cities. It's another Gentile area. He's not going home to Judah. He's going to Decapolis, the Gentile area. And we know from verse 32 that he not only healed these Gentiles, which by the way means he has to touch them, okay, with all of their infirmities, bacteria, viruses, skin diseases, whatever else. He is touching them. He is not only showing compassion, but he is actually defiling himself according to Jewish Jewish custom. But he does it, verse 32 says, for three days. Three days! How many of us have ever spent three days visiting one person in an air-conditioned hospital? And Jesus, like an army medic, is working triage for three days. And as he's healing them, he's teaching them, and he's sharing with them the good news. And you would think, whew, my tank of compassion is empty after three days, right? But that's not what happens, because you're going to look at the next section, he's going to say, I feel kind of bad for them because they're hungry. Look at how the Gentiles respond. Verse 31. And they glorified God. Is that what it says? Look closer. What does it say? And they glorified the God of Israel. Just like the Canaanite woman, they they worshipped the God of Israel. Now again, I mean, the, the disciples have to be scratching their head. You know, this is not what I signed up for here, okay? When I signed up to be part of the king's court and to usher in the messianic kingdom... This is not what I expected. And yet, there has to be a little deja vu, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, going on in their mind. They worship the God of Israel. Diseases are getting healed. This sounds vaguely familiar. This sounds a whole lot like a psalm of David. A psalm I know all too well. A psalm that is our psalm as a Jew. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits. Who pardons all of our iniquities, who's, who heals all of our diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. Again, I don't think the disciples are getting it here and now, but they have to be replaying this over in their head later. It makes sense. The Gentiles are fellow heirs. I can't deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of David. He is the Messiah. He is the one we've been waiting for. He is the King. But I also can't deny that the blessings I am seeing poured out on people 
are not just Jews. There's only one way to explain that, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs to the promise. Look at our third point, unclean community. Verse 32, And Jesus called His disciples to Him and said, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with Me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I do not want to send them away hungry, for they might faint along the way. Now don't miss the connection here. From a Jewish perspective, He has certainly defiled Himself by talking to this Canaanite woman, by touching these Gentile people, and by touching people who are ill in and of themselves. And yet, this unmistakably is a godlike compassion because these are Gentile dogs. They're not worth anything according to Jews. And if you're reading this in one sitting, or better yet, if you're Matthew's church hearing this for the first time, you've got to realize that just five minutes ago, you realized that the Pharisees were unwilling to obey the fifth commandment and unwilling to show compassion to even their closest kin, their mom and their dad. And yet Jesus is showing compassion not to something that's easy like his, his mom or dad or his kin or even his own people, but the Gentiles. And not just a little compassion, but three days of healing and now feeding. And you know the story. This time he takes seven loaves and a few fish and, and multiplies them miraculously using the same phraseology he is giving them to his disciples and they're giving them to the people. He's expecting them to draw upon his resources, trusting him and showing compassion. And if you'll remember in the feeding of the 5,000, there were how many baskets left over? Twelve. For the king's abundance signified that it will provide major blessing for the 12 tribes of Israel. I would say if that's true and that's pretty safe, what do we do with seven baskets left over here? Well, in Scripture, seven is always the number of perfection or completion. The Lord created six days and rested on the seventh. So it seems reasonable to think that the King's coming brings blessing, but that that blessing is actually completed in going to all the nations, not just the Jews. Now, do you think this might make sense? Because how is Matthew going to end his Gospel about going and making disciples to just the Jews? To all the nations. To all the nations. And then when Acts opens up, the birth of the church, that you shall be my witnesses. Where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost ends of the earth. Romans 11 even talks about the fullness of the Gentiles coming in and then elect Israel will be saved. I don't know exactly what seven means here, but I would say it seems to make sense that the Messiah's mission and blessing will be completed when it jumps the banks of the Jews and the covenant blessing is experienced by the whole world. Give me just a minute. Let me walk through with you what I mean. Because I don't think Jesus is changing the rules here on defilement. I think this is something that was always intended, right? So God calls Abraham, a pagan, out of Ur of the Chaldees, which, by the way, was metropolis for child sacrifice. He saves him and sends him to a country that he doesn't know, to a people he doesn't have yet, and he promises him three things. Land, seed, and blessing. Genesis 12. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's exactly what Jesus is doing. Isaiah 42.6 I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations. We just talked about the Great Commission. Making disciples of all the nations. Acts 1.8 And even into the remotest part of the earth. 
by the Jews' transgression. Romans 11, salvation has come to the Gentiles. And it comes together in Revelation 5.9 and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals for you were slain and purchased for God and with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. This is not a new plan. This was the plan from the beginning. It was the Jews who perverted it. And it was Christ who came to explain the mystery in more fullness. I imagine when the Apostle John was writing, blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, that this miracle came to mind. It was a preview of what was to come. It was a preview of the Messianic banquet where yes, even the Canaanite woman was invited. Even those with infirmities and diseases were invited. Yes, even the Gentile dogs. No, don't come get the breadcrumbs. Come and feast at the table of the Lord. And they say, but why? We don't deserve it. You're right, you don't deserve it. None of us deserve it. But Jesus Christ lived the life that we could not live and paid the price that we deserved. And those who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ are co-heirs in the Abrahamic covenant. Co-heirs in the kingdom. And you say, well man, that's some great theology. Amen? Right? Yeah. What do we do with it? I'm glad we know that theology that just exalts Jesus Christ in my mind. I'm going to sing a little bit louder at the end of the service. This is all great, right? No. I think there's more here. So we've got to press in. This is when we do our Bible study methods. We've got to press in a little bit and say, what does this mean for us? Not what does this mean for me? What does God have for me? No, 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 no. As the church, what is our responsibility? What are we supposed to get out of this passage more than that amazing concept that Jesus is God? There's more here. Let me show you the easiest way to answer that. When you go exploring and you're looking for solid bedrock truth of how to apply the Word of God, ask yourself this question. Not what does it mean for me personally. What did it mean to the original hearers? What does this mean or what was this supposed to mean to the church that Matthew was reading to? Because the New Testament is written to the church of Jesus Christ of which we are a part. Okay? So let's ask the question here. What was Peter supposed to get out of this? What were the disciples supposed to get out of this? The disciples who would go and plant churches, what were they supposed to get out of this? We don't have to wonder. This is what's so exciting. We don't have to wonder. Scripture tells us. Now, I don't think Peter got it in the moment. Peter doesn't get much in the moment, right? Okay? We don't get much in the moment. But later on, God hits him with a two-by-four, and he gets it. Okay? He has this vision. I talked about it last week. Vision of a sheet. And what's on the sheet? All sorts of animals. Four-footed, all, you know, fish, you name it, it's all there. And it comes down out of heaven and then goes back up and comes out. And, and the voice out of heaven says, Arise, kill, and eat. What does Peter say? No, 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 no. Hey, hey. If I touch some of those unclean animals, they will defile me. You see where this is going, right? <laughs> no, no, no. I've never eaten anything that would defile me. And God says, what I have declared clean, no longer call unclean. It's not just about food. Because right about this time, there's a knock at his door. And who is it? It's men sent from Cornelius, who has been praying to God. Cornelius, a Gentile man. And God says, I've answered your prayers. Send men to go get Peter. And Peter comes to Cornelius' house. Let me read to you what he says when he gets to Cornelius' house. He says, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. Yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. This is not about bacon and shrimp, as good as it is, right? This is about no man is considered unclean and that Gentiles are fellow heirs with the Jews. And Peter got it. Okay, yeah, he stumbled occasionally, and would withdraw, but he got it. How do we know? Well, we've got lots of Scripture. We also know that he probably died where? 
in Rome. Ministering and giving the gospel in Rome. He no longer saw people as unclean. He went to them. He showed compassion to them. And he gave them the good news of Jesus Christ because he cared about them as an overflow of his love for God. All right? So what does this mean for us? Well, I don't consider people unclean. I I get that. I get that. Okay. You may not, but if you're like me, you functionally consider many people to be outside your circle and the results are the same. Yeah, we may live a mile apart, but you know, not really part of my social circle. I don't work with them. We don't speak the same language, same culture. So therefore, you know, hey, I don't look down on them, but they're just, they're just not part of my people. And yet, Scripture says, that's our mission field. It starts in Jerusalem before it goes to Judea or Samaria or to the other ends of the earth. That we're called to roll our sleeves up and get our hands dirty. Not in a ceremonial sense, but in a sense we go outside our comfort zone. Simply put, with the message of the gospel, we are to be Jesus' ambassadors, bringing belonging to the outcast, mending for the broken, and satisfaction for the starved. And this is done through imparting the word and imparting our lives. Let's just be real honest here. We've got enough mission opportunities in Dallas-Fort Worth alone to choke a horse. I'm all for sending money overseas, but think about it practically. How much better if we can then take not only our financial resources, but couple it with our own sweat equity and emulate Christ, going to those outside our circle, touching them, giving them the gospel, and watching Christ expand His kingdom. And you say, but I don't know where to begin. I get that. And it's hard. It's especially hard in this town that loves its wealth and hates accountability. Let's just be honest, okay? You know, you got enough money in this town, you don't need anyone. There's a lot of money in this town. That said, that's never stopped the gospel before. There's a lot of different ways. Let me give us one idea. In your bulletin, I've placed some ante supalabra flyers. Okay? I'm going to stretch us outside our comfort zone. I want you to keep them with you. I want you to put them in your car. I want you to put them inside your folder or your book or wherever you go. Next time you're at a Starbucks, a Panera, next time you're, you're just outside your house and you hear someone speaking Spanish, go introduce yourself. Give them your best buenos dias. Maybe even throw in a que tal, Okay? And then fumble around in English and give them this flyer. And you say, but I, I, don't, I don't speak Spanish. You know what? You probably don't have to. We, we stumbled upon something very interesting this last, uh, last couple of weeks. On the registration in Ante Suplabra, you can sign up in your language of choice. Okay, first of all, 100% of the people signing up, almost 100% are Latinos. Do you know how many are signing up in English? 50%. In Texas, most Latinos are bilingual. You probably don't even have to speak Spanish. But seek to bridge the culture by showing compassion, by being obedient to go to them, by inviting them. In fact, go a step further. Say, yeah, you know, this conference costs, it costs $69, but here's my name and phone number. If you want to go, I'll pay half. You pay for it, you come to me, I'll give you half back. Make sure they've got skin in the game, but show them you care. This is not the only way, but I'm just trying to give us examples. I was in Panera the other day, and, and there was a, a couple of folks speaking Spanish, and I thought, yep, it'd be uncomfortable to go over there and talk to them because my Spanish is not nearly good enough. But I have yet to see anyone mock me for trying, especially when I'm giving something and not asking for something. We need to do this. Why? Well, because Christ did it. That's a big part of it. But let me give you one more reason. Someone did it for us. Someone risked their relationship. Someone got out of their comfort zone.
to share Jesus Christ with us. Shouldn't we do the same?